Happy to be here. Good morning to you all. Good to you guys see you. I will be talking about RCVP, which is what I mostly talk about. I'm involved with a couple of other things too, but this is, uh, this is mostly it. Um, by way um, of an intro, I think I give this a focus on applications, because the URL conference has application right in the title, so I get to that um, at the very end. I'm um, going to set the scene a little bit, you know, why R, motivation of why RCVP and all those things. And um, typically I would have had um, a set of bullet points there, but, you know, it's 2015 and bullet points are so last century, so it'll just be a set of tweets because that was easy enough to, to collect. So this was one from a few years ago, which I quite liked. That's um, some uh, that's research consulting staff from the IQSS at Harvard. RCVP to leverage the speed of C++ and the clarity and ease of R. I quite like that. So that's the theme that we're going to come back to. Um, what RCPP offers is really a combination of the best aspects I didn't set my timer on, uh, of, um, of R that we like for modeling and um, um, and the performance of C++. Um, similarly, this is from, um, from an acquaintance in Australia. You know, every time I rewrite R code in RCVP, I go, holy shit, that's fast. That's the point. So um, unapologetic about that. It's good for many things, but just doing what you're doing faster is, is, is a very legit reason. Um, uh, that one was more recent. Uh, that one's a bit on the scheme of unbelievable. Um, you know, thanks to Hadley's book and Dirk and Roman's RCVP code, a 750-fold speed up. Those you don't see very often. You must start from relatively poor code to get that much of a lift. But, uh, you know, it wasn't me who claimed that, so I leave the uh, quality of the code to, to him. Um, another Australian. Um, so, you know, whenever you go back from the C API for R, and I tend to have that in longer presentations to really set the stage of, and we have that really briefly today, then um, all these things that we're doing were, of course, available and possible beforehand. They were just much more tedious. And that was if one hits that. It's just, it's, it's, it's really so much quicker to get things going, which is an important point too. Um, and apparently there was a conference here last year with a certain Wickham who said that, you know, RCPP is one of the three things that um, changed the way he writes R code. And RCPP is so widely used and quite possibly on every one of your machines because Hadley uses it, so I'm sort of, I'm in the Hadley stack now, so there you go. So <clears throat> what is this all about? It's about extending R. That's a mantra that I've used for quite some time because that's really what it does. We're sitting on the R API and we want to, to take it to some other um, places. So I like those two points in combination. Or those two, those two words as a, as a slogan, as a title. And it so happens I got a draft of John Chambers' next book emailed by him last week, which will be entitled, according to this draft, Extending R. So, you know, I'm quite in favor. The book's great. It so happens that um, I used this slide with a bunch of his books to um, describe the history and evolution of S to R over the years. But... Given, uh, you know, given the time that we have available today, I'm not going to dwell much on it. If you're, if you're old hands like myself, you may have seen this, less likely this, have heard about that, and this one really predates things, sort of. Uh, but nice cadence, 77, 98, uh, 88, 98, 2008, so that gives you some expectations of um, when the next book may come, but maybe he'll, uh, maybe he'll beat the 10-year pattern. If I rile him up with a comment like that, he will certainly will. And, and I'm really enjoying the draft so far, so it should. So um, this, of course, is a given to all of you because you're R users. But when I do an intro talk like this to mixed audiences that haven't seen R, I often start with an example like this. R is great. We get access to data. Um, so there is a data set labeled or a column of, of timing for eruptions in a data set faithful. Faithful is a geyser in one of the U.S. national parks. We can take that and estimate a density. Density estimate is, you know, sort of a, a more modern alternative to a histogram and plot it. And out comes something like this without having to do anything more. R does sort of some magic. How's my pointer doing? Some magic behind the scenes to 
to get the right parameters, uh, label the graph, do the right things automatically. It has some magic notions of object orientation there. It's all good. I picked that example, though, and it's borrowed from a post from the uh, I Help List from a couple of years ago because it's this slide that makes it better. Because, you know, taking a data set and estimating a density you can do in any dozen of languages. Doing this um, on a screen full is a lot harder. We're basically just working around the same example, and I'm not going to chew all through all of this in full detail, but we're again, we're, we're estimating the density, not plotting it, picking up the x um, coordinates to set a grid for a new density estimate on resample data that's just constrained to be on the same x-axis, which gives us then 10,000 new realizations from which we can just read out the, the empirical quantiles of the distribution to get estimates for the um, uncertainty distribution about the, I mean, replit, plot, put a gray shaded polygon around it, and now we have the same density estimate with the non-parametrically estimated um, uh, uncertainty band around it. That's, that's pretty nice, and that's very, that's very R. So that's, that's why we like R. We can quickly explore, um, model, visualize, access data, and it's also a good example because it already evolved in simulation. You know, simulation can sometimes get slow, long, time-consuming. Maybe we want to do things that are more complicated than the density estimate here. That gets us back to extending and why R and RCPP. But sort of to recap, you know, R, we all love it. We can work interactively. We work with data. We get any type of data, can write data back, can summarize and report in any way, shape, or form, PDF, Markdown, HTML, Shiny. Um, so that's why we're all here. It rocks. Um, back to extending, um, that's always been possible from the very beginning. R itself um, is an interpreter with the core of C and a healthy dose of Fortran for numerics. So those things already being used in the system, obviously, were always available for extensions. Simon Urbanek uh, built the first large uh, new language extension with R Java maybe a decade ago, maybe a little bit more than a decade ago. Um, and when we started with RCPP, that was always our benchmark. I mean, around the first releases, I think he had about 30 packages on CRAN, and RCPP grew out of another package of mine, so we always had you know, one to start with. Um, and I remember there was a bit of a watershed for us when we reached parity, which may have been sort of in the high 60s. Um, we're a bit higher now, and our Java really hasn't, hasn't grown for various reasons. Um, you know, Java has its fans and its detractors. I'm in the latter camp most of the time, but be that... Um, uh, what it may. Um, C++ has always been possible, too. If you look really, really carefully on CRAN, um, maybe in the archive section, I think it's still there because, you know, released code doesn't, doesn't really disappear. There's a, there's a trial package called CXX by Kurt Hornick, which does very, very little, but it's, it's there. It's a, it's a proof of concept that you could connect to C++ basically through the C interface. So it all worked, but it was a pain. So back to you know why um, why extending R, there is already uh, the the forthcoming book notwithstanding an excellent discussion in the last Chambers book. I think it's chapters eleven and twelve that are yeah exactly interfaces Roman one interfaces Roman two, and in interfaces Roman one he sort of discusses it with C and Fortran, and sort of makes this very point. It's it's a C it's R's a C program. It's always been extendable via C, but. If you want to go there, um, sort of be ready for pitfalls, added dangers, sec faults, substantial debugging, oh my god, late nights. Uh, so you need to have a really good reason. Or be very curious or crazy. So uh, I sort of joke that he summarizes that up in a bit of a you know, football score. Uh, and after 90 minutes, after this discussion, he comes up with a four to three, narrowly. So it is more work, there will be bugs when you do that. Or when you did it in the old way, it was quite likely that you got platform dependency. The way you set things up may have worked on your Unix workstation, but not carry over to Windows all that easily. And the code is in a different language, maybe less clear. But you know, there's, there's upsides. There's clearly cases where it's, where it's worth it. Um, often you can connect to new libraries that other people have built. 
the speed argument trumps a lot of other things, and you get you get references in in, in various ways. I mean, references as in reference classes, uh, reference objects, uh, environments, object references. So um, to sum up again, um, why do we do this? Speed, new things, references, which is sort of good enough. So that then gets us back to once we settled on yes, we really want to extend R. Why on earth would we use C++ for that? You know, you had these coffee house conversations or, you know, something at the bar counter with a friend and thinking about writing something in a compiled language, what is C++? And people go, oh my god, why would you use C++? Well, of course you would use C++. So if you ask Google why C++, um, uh, it's sort of a bit random. You know, they always have this counter when you have a query about what comes back. So when I prepared those slides a year ago, it was 52. That was up from high 30s. When it did last week, it said 46 million. So the, in, in the pruning of their results set, it varies a little, but millions. So obviously, there's lots, lots, lots of answers. Wikipedia, as always, has a perfectly fine, if overly pedantic, definition saying that it's statically typed. That means it's different from R. When you want a double, you have to say double. It remains a double. Uh, Freeform multi-paradigm means you can program different ways. It is compiled, yes, that's where we get the speed. General purpose, it's not a domain-specific language. Uh, powerful programming language. Um, and um, just, you know, as an, as an anecdote, it comes from Bell Labs, the same place where R comes from. They once wrote this as a better C initially to deal with the very large code systems that they have for the telephone system. At the time, 100,000 lines of code was sort of a benchmark, and they felt they couldn't do that with plain C anymore. Um, it's, it's everywhere. It's industrial strengths. It's not tied to a particular firm, just how you know, Java, for better or worse, hangs with Oracle, go with Google, and things like that. Widely used and still evolving. Um, C11 and 14 are big rebirths of the language that brought a lot of strengths to it. If you're coming from science or research, it's there everywhere. I mean, of course, you still run into people who insist that, oh my god, if you do something numeric, you have to use Fortran. There's nothing wrong with Fortran, but I mean, it's, it's most performance tests actually don't see that much of a difference. You get vectorized uh, compiler instructions out of good C++ compilers, too. And um, it's just so widely used that if you want to do something, you know, fancy uh, deep learning, neural nets, this and that. I mean, when those people don't work in Python or Lua, there's often C++ APIs behind and those you can then pay, tie to R if you want to. And there's lots of, uh, there's lots of tooling support because it's so widely used as well. Um, an excellent intro uh, and, and general reference to C++ is provided by the books by Myers. Um, effective C++, more effective C++, uh, effective SDL, and now he has one on C++ 11. In the first one, the effective C++, where the first edition, maybe 20 years old by now, the first, it, it's, it, it's an excellent book. It's, uh, it used to be 50, and the second edition became 55 different, basically, topics, stories, individual aspects that you, that they build a bit on top of each other, but they easily digestible uh, independently. And the very first one just sort of set the scene, what is C++? And he had coined this term that it is really a federation, a union of four distinct languages. And you can take uh, any one or two or three of these, you're never um, forced to combine all of these. So when I, as a grad student, um, 20, almost 25 years ago, started learning C++ from C, I was joking that I was writing C with a single plus, because I was still mostly writing C, and just using a few chosen extensions that made it a, a better C. So you don't have to go all the way in. There's object orientation. The templated stuff is very, very important and very, very complicated. In essence, only C++ does that. And that means, um, I have an example a little bit later. It basically means that programs can be written so that they get run when the program is compiled. So you're, you're, you're transferring um, runtime complexity, performance that would happen otherwise when your program runs, from the time that it runs to the time that it's being compiled making the compilation a little longer, but your runtime performance. And it gives you other tricks. So that, that's a bit of the magic behind um, RCPP. But you need, don't need to use that just when you, when you um, dip your toes into C++ via RCPP. And the SDL is a big uh, library to it that is moving towards the standard. It, it used to just be outside. And then there's the whole C++, C++ 11, 14, and C++ 14. Um, 
fifth leg that, that could really be uh, called a fifth uh, language. So, so back to, you know, extending R, good, we settled that. Why C++? It's really mature, um, but current. Uh, C++ has a really strong um, focus on, on performance, and we had a talk by Strustrup in Chicago when the, when the language standards committee met there, they were, they were there two years ago, and he was basically waving a phone. Why is this focus on performance so strong? Um, because you, you need, you need performance in a really um, skinny, close to the bone, close to the metal level. Java has a virtual machine in between, uh, C Sharp has a runtime in between, um, not with C++. The code that you create, even though it can be really abstract and high level, like R code in some places, gets compiled down to machine code that is, that is super efficient, so you get possibly the highest performance per for energy spent, and that's why I was waving the phone, because on phone that matters, you don't have extra energy to spend, because if it consumes too much energy, your battery life gets down, and your consumers get very unhappy. Um, and um, C++ 11 is a big deal, and then 14 and 17 will, will, will be, um, and it's all rich and complex, but you know the promise that we're making here is that RCPP mostly shields you from that, and I'm going to show an example or two. Um, doing okay on time, I think, here. Um, uh, there's something else I borrowed from, from John that was in a presentation that, I, that he had once given, and I got to visit him right afterwards. So this is a, this is a napkin sketch. They, they drew that on a piece of paper at Bell Labs in 76, almost 40 years ago. And um, they, they used the noun, the interface, as a description of, of the system that they were planning to do. And it's something really not, not unlike R, but this, this drawing was done, the sketch was made before S even existed. So the, the idea here really is that you have trusted numerical core algorithms. Think of something, you know, like the Fortran code behind LM for us. Um, so those things we take from libraries, but then we put wrappers around it, X ABC, an accessor, or, or say another Fortran subroutine there, it says, to access the actual library between ABC, and then there's some notion about how do we best get from 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 a dreamt up to be interactive <coughs> system to this X ABC um, interface to the library, and he just brought that up by saying that you know the way how we how we seamlessly get from whole R objects via RCPP to C++ is is possibly the closest the closest match to that old this old vision. So, so really what that, what they dreamt about in 76 is something that we have now. We have compiled code, you already get so and so many libraries that come with R and you can very easily build packages that connect to libraries with, with glue code like RCPP. So there's compiled code, proven libraries, high performance, serial or parallel if you, if you so choose, interpreted code at the same time at the R console, it's an environment made for programming with data. We can explore, visualize, workflow, rapid prototyping. It's, a, it's sort of a best of both worlds with the existing interface. And that's, that's where, where RCPP sort of sits. Um, we claim it's easy to learn. There's not uh, too much of a transition from R. It's easy to use because we've managed, by sitting on top of things that the R build system and package system offers, um, and I should iterate again, that is a, a truly outstanding system. I mean, not only what's, what's in R itself, sort of this family of, of R command, subcommands, but the whole CRAN infrastructure is just, it's just tremendous. So we can basically just call out to R command build with, with um, little hooks that we can play into, and with that, uh, everything happens irrespective of the operating system, and for the user, it's really just one command. It's expressive. Um, we managed to sneak some tricks in by using C++ facilities so that you get vectorized C++ that looks like vectorized sugar. So if in R you have a, you have a vector x and you want to calculate the min or the max, you call min or man on that. If you want to call, or if you want to recompute the range, you do you know max minus min. We can do the same in C++, which is which is nice. Very important. It's seamless to all R objects um, because <coughs> the the underlying <coughs> representation of, of things that R uses is, is in a particular data type that's implemented in C that maps so neatly and that we have such good access to from C++. We get all those things, you know, as they are. 
a vector, a matrix, a list, all um, of the standard object-oriented types, even environments, functions, and so on. Mm -hmm. So whatever is in R, we can, we can access. Um, and then, of course, it makes things faster, particularly simple things. Loops, um, as an interpreted language, R has its issues there. Function calls, R has a bit more overhead there, so they're also easily replaced. And uh, extensions, we can build a lot with that. So that was sort of, that was the scene, the setting. Uh, what do we want to do? Why don't we want to do it? And, and why in this combination of languages? And now I'm just going to walk you through um, a standard example that I've, that I've used in a couple of other presentations. Um, it's, it's a super famous example. You've probably seen this equation before. It's a recurrence definition was that uh, we're defining a function so that the value for the nth, um, the value returned for an argument n is the sum of the two preceding calls, so it's recursive, and the recursion breaks uh, for really small n. So it just descends. f of 6 is the sum of f of 5 plus f of 4. It then gets evolved again. f of 5 gets resolved to the sum of 4 plus 3. And it's in this tree descent that the, um, that the terrible performance of this elegant algorithm comes to bear. The thing is actually worse than exponential, which takes some effort to create an algorithm. So the comp side people love the algorithm, and there are a billion uh, discussions on, on the web uh, on it. I dug that into that a little because in the, in the, in the book that I ended up writing on RCVP, I walked through um, this with a couple of simpler examples. So just uh, you know, to, to, to steal some thunder, you can, of course, also serialize that or have other tricks of memorization in there. There's one example that I took from Pat's book you know, that does that. But naively implemented, this thing will be expensive because it's doubly recursive without remembering values that it already has. The nice thing about it, though, is that the formula is very clean. It's a two-liner, right? It just has a curly brace. In this case, we compute that. Otherwise, in the default, we, we do that, which whips maps perfectly into R code. So we want to calculate a function f of a single argument n as the sum of the two preceding values, unless the value is already very small. That's, that's basically that. Um, called on the, and you know, there's, if, if you look that up, there's, uh, there's sort of competing definitions. I have one here that starts at uh, first argument zero, some other ones do it with one, and then you get a slightly different, uh, different sequence. But what I didn't specify, but what holds the thing is always uh, non-negative. So there's, uh, this only works on, um, on integers uh, zero or larger. Um, so that's straightforward implementation. Where does the problem come from? Well, as I, as I alluded to, its, it's performance um, grows in time much faster than the arguments go. So I have a quick, this is sort of, um, you know, our markdown, nitter, pendog. So this really got computed. These are the legit time on my, on my laptop. 100 calls for F10 are 26 milliseconds. If I just go from an um, argument 10 to an argument 15, so I'm just adding 5. Unfortunately, the performance increases more than tenfold. If I do that again from F15 to F20, another more than tenfold um, case. That's really, really bad. The question that I caught there on Stack Overflow was from someone who wrote this in R and naively threw in, I think, F35, which for a single call then ends up being 35 minutes on the machine he had at the time. And he was wondering, why, really? And of course, one can do better. In, in, in various ways, but the, but the naive implementation that's faithful to the actual definition of the problem gets very expensive because of these repeated function calls. And you know, there's no mystery to that. Uh, function calls are a little expensive in R, and solving something with recursive function calls makes you pay that expense over and over and over. But um, we're here to talk about R and C, C++. So the obvious call then is, well, couldn't we do it in C or C++? And if you know a little bit of C or C++ from an intro course at college or whatever, you would, you would set something like this up. It looks basically like the R code. And that's sort of one of our selling points, that it doesn't have to be very complicated. The one thing that's different is now we have to say in twice, or you, you, you could say double, then you're a little safer to overflow. But for simplicity, let's just say in here. Because the language is typed, so we're just basically saying we're returning an int given an int. And then it's pretty much the same code as an R, apart from the fact that we have to end lines with semicolons uh, by convention. But um, 
The point then is, if we've written this, how do we call this from R? And that's sort of where the world was 10 years ago, pre-RCPP, you would have to go in, write that in a file, compile the file, have it create an object file, load the object file, make it accessible. How you did that was a little different on a Mac than from a Windows machine because the object file had different names. I've been through all of that because I had that in intro tutorials for HPC. Um, so this I took from a presentation from this summer from a um, um, Metzubinsky, who's a, who's a prof at Aalborg, where, where, where user was, coincidentally, he's at the same university. Uh, he, here's an example, and this is helpful here because it shows us the other pain that R had pre-RCPP. So this really is how you would get it to work. We have the actual worker function, we've now called it Fibonacci in C implementation. That's basically the, the exact same thing as on the previous slide, apart from the fact that we had to rename the identifier. That one's not callable from R. If we want something callable from R, we have to rewrite everything with these magic hidden objects that can be anything in R. They're called S-expression pointers, S-E-X-P. It's a bit of a mouthful. And basically, these interfaces, the, the single interface that we have always returns a S-E-X-P as a result of a function being called with one or more of these things. And we always have to map back and forth, and it's it's, and, and this is sort of standard, and you will find code like this in a million um, R packages on CRAN, including R base itself. So if you want to return a vector, you have to allocate space for it, even if it's a single value. You have to protect that allocation, later unprotect that allocation. It's all terrible. And that even is, um, is, just, uh, is just the basics before the compiling and linking. So that, that was the tedium. You can do this now from RCPP a little bit better via this trick, I'll show you that, uh, a bit more about that in a second, but this is a slight variation on Matt's file. This I could now call into, into me, uh, my R session by just saying um, source CPP, a variant around the source program, and it would, it would have this runnable. But it's still, instead of one function, now we have two functions, which is, which is sort of not good. Um, with RCPP, things are a lot easier. Um, uh, and over the years, the package has grown, has gotten more features. A big contribution came by, by, by JJ of uh, our studio fame um, a couple of years ago, basically just before my, my book came out. Um, the, the book is still full with usage of a package called Inline, which is similar to this. We submit basically programs that we write as R strings. So they're single text, we submit them, and then a function picks them up, compiles links, loads them, does all of that. And uh, JJ greatly extended that. We call this RCPP attributes now. The main workhorse is a source function, or the, or the main, but those, there's, several, there's several modes. You use them on a package, you use them on an entire file, but you can also use them on one-liners. Imagine the green stuff to be a single line um, in, your, in your shell session. I've just broken it out here to have line breaks to, to make it read simpler. So from this quote to that quote, as far as R is concerned, this is a constant text string. So it could be hello world that you stick into cat, here it's just a string. This just happens to be the same uh, C program for Fibonacci sequence that we had a few slides ago. By sticking it into this worker function, CPP function, the code is uh, saved to disk, um, ornamented a little with glue code that's needed, and then the system just goes off, compile links, loads that, and makes it available to us under that symbol that we have in the code. So there's, there's a bit of clever logic in there that it gets passed, but once that happens, we have a function g, and now we can calculate the same um, recurrence equation that we calculated in R from C++. We get the same numbers, and the nice thing, of course, then is that you want to benchmark these. So for an argument of 25, f, the R implementation, g, the C++ C++ implementation, um, on my laptop, I uh, get a speed difference of about 480. So that's a really nice number, that's a really high number, that's a much higher number than you see in normal examples. We see in sort of standard looping examples, MCMC -MC simulations, 30, 50, 70, 84 things, you rarely get uh, north of 100. So uh, this, is, this is really tempting and promising, but, but generally speaking, we're, we don't get that much. This is a reflection of the fact that, that um, recursion is expensive. But the nice thing is, it's super cheap. I mean, this is, this is sort of legit. There was a one-liner defining function f before, then you add these four few more lines, and, and you have something producing identical results. I don't have the all equal on there, but we, we show the output, show the output of the first 11 calls. 
um, you know, 400, 500 volts. So, um, but that's really just one of two things. So runtime performance is really important because you know we don't want to wait for results, but time to code is really important too. That's the other thing that RCBP makes makes easier. I showed you these examples about how tedious it was to set up old code. New code is much it's much easier. You write them in a single file, you source the file, and then there's a bit of code generation behind it that makes that that makes it easy, and um, you don't have to worry about. It operating system specific things, it's just your generic R code and C++ code and it will work on Macs, Windows, Linux um, and development tools help as well, so our studio is good there. Here's a cute little footnote and I owe that to the same presentation by Matt, he's a, he's a really sharp cookie, so <clears throat> if you know a bit more C++ and current C++, there's a new thing in um, many new things in C++ 11, but here we're using const expression Const expression means that, if possible, evaluate this expression at compile time. So this one basically just means um, a const expression returning an int for this recursive uh, expression where, where we're just writing the, the, the equation differently. This gets evaluated at compile time, of course, with a single fixed argument. It's cheating. But he had a had a he had a longer presentation there. He had several examples. He also walked us through a um, parallel execution of Fibonacci. The key thing with this one is that basically the runtime of this is zero for the fixed number because the compiler spent some time figuring out that number for a particular argument. Here we use you know 42 for cutesiness. I stuck this in here and then timed it. You can then stick it back in micro benchmark and time it from the R prompt. What you then will be timing is just the cost of function calls because the body of this function, this thing is 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 zero. That's that's pre-computed. So that's that's a super um, elegant trick if you need constants, magic numbers, um, things in, uh, in in your program. So um, where are we with um, with RCPP now? It's it's good. I had a similar chart on, you know, I was asked to keynote at USR last year at UCLA. I had the same chart up and I was pretty much stunned. That was, uh, so it was the week before the July 4th and I just was going over that keynote presentation to see what I talked about then. We were very happy then to have 223 or something like that, 226 or something like that packages. We're basically double now and it's 15 months later. So the, the slope of this curve is still, it's still unbelievable. I mean, I do still enough of a vanity check there that I see every day, every other day, what new packages are there. And now we have sort of 15, 18 new ones a month. It's, it's really, really gratifying. It puts a little bit of cost on me because I also then am the you know, acting release manager for RCVP, so whenever we release a new version, I have to check that all these 400 plus now compile, and that basically takes, uh, takes a night. So that, I'm not sure if Andrew is in the room, but that brought a big smile to my face then at, at USR this year. He had a big presentation about the, the, the picture is very fuzzy. I was a little slow getting my, my phone out. I wanted to snap the previous slide, which just had the table of the page rank, I mean, as in, who refers to whom, who cites whom in, in, in the Google terminology of PageRank, which package, it turned out that just this summer, I guess RCPP became PageRank 1 on CRAN. Uh, this is sort of the dependency graph, and it's, it's about as bold, as big as, as, as Ripley's MASS, but you know, sort of, we're there. So that's, that's pretty impressive too, but that's mostly, I would say that's mostly due to, um, uh, to Headley relying on RCPP in a great number of his packages, because lots of people use his packages, so with that, we get uh, pulled in everywhere. So um, again, Earl has this A in there for application, so I thought I should close on a really quick little uh, application just to talk about something different. At USA, then I switched over to Docker that I'm a big fan of and talked about that. So RBLP API. Um, this is sort of kind of funny. We run this R in finance conference. I'm one of the, the co-founders and organizers of that in, in, in Chicago, and I, talked, I gave a lightning talk about that in uh, in, in May when we talked about that. I have a bit of a personal history that I wrote the very first Bloomberg connection from R a decade plus ago and talked about this. This was a presentation that I gave at, the, at one of the first use R's in 2004. Uh, I then left that job, the code stayed there, Anna Nelson picked it up, there was a Java re-implementation. Uh, I kept going on, Bloomberg did that much better, there's a fantastic API that they're, they're, they're doing good. And at that point in time in uh, a few months ago, um, I had joined John and Witt, uh, who had put together a re-implementation in C++ using RCVP. So at the time, 
we said present and future was that, um, was that GitHub repo. Well, it actually got a lot better, and that I'm just going to mention now where, you know, why open source is sort of cool in some ways, because in that talk, I made some sort of hand-waving remarks that this will never ever make it to Cran, and it turns out it is now on Cran. How did that happen? Well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of get to that, but some of these, these slides are then borrowed from the earlier presentation. The new version is really lighter, no longer Java involved. Installation is much easier. You don't have to set that up. Don't have to fight environment variables. You get RBLP from Cran, and you're done. It's simpler. We can write code more easily. I added a couple of, of functions, and um, Basically, back then when I said, yep, it's good, it's robust and fast, it runs with Travis implementation uh, integration, you get it from GitHub. Um, I have one of these, uh, I have that in a draft, so you can install it with install packages from there. Um, but now we know it's on, it's on, it's on, it's on Cran. If you're into finance, I'm a bit surprised to see that because whenever I go to these, these functions, of course, I look at people from my industry, there don't seem to be that many here, but then you may know a couple of these functions on the X or other interfaces, some of these things are really are really uh, nifty. Bloomberg is super powerful, but I'm not going to, to dwell uh, into that. So what I said then in May was, this is really good, you know, fixed dimension retrieval of data with callbacks works really well, uh, builds with a shared library, we got it to build on that other thing. And then we said what may uh, not work, I just referred to it, that other us, it, it may not work. Now, I have a little bit of battle scars and experiences, uh, experience with integrating C++ code across these operating system, and I just point blankly said, you cannot do this because there is sort of an issue that Visual Studio Code and, and GNU G++ Code don't mix because C++ left one door open. When a function gets translated into option code, how the function signature at the machine level is named is not standardized. It varies between compilers, which makes the compiler mixing impossible. So I basically just said, well, you know, I don't really, don't really see that happen. But we close by saying, you know, it has these and these features. Pull requests are welcome. And buying large, so and then we kind of said, yep, this is all, this is all good. We, we like this. Um, because it relies on a little bit of code by Bloomberg that they give us free to use, but not with, with source. It may not go to CRAN, but it's on, on GitHub. That was the state of the matter in May. And I stopped that talk by sort of saying, you know, this is really good. Powerful APIs uh, are a force. Providing working code is, is, is key. When you do that, you, um, you may get people building up on your code and carrying it to, into new, some, some new directions that you haven't expected. And that's exactly what happened. Someone actually looked at this more closely and kind of figured that in this particular case, it actually does work with Windows support. That must mean that at an interfacing level somewhere at Bloomberg, there it's hidden that it's all just C code because otherwise we couldn't, we couldn't use that. But, I then got sorted out with CRAN how we could do this by keeping the CRAN politics hold. So our code is in the source package, and when the package is built, it, it pulls down the dependencies from Bloomberg at, at build time. But now you have an out-of-the-box um, binary on all OSs that, that just works. And that, um, um, that really is a, is a good thing and was a, was, was a really good and humbling sort of experience. I mean, I said Windows is impossible and someone proved me wrong and uh, we're all better for it. It's, it's really good. But the talk basically was about RCPP, so summing up, you know, if you're curious about RCPP, where can you go? The package comes with uh, eight or nine, depending on how you count. The ninth is just a collation and PDF of the unit has PDF vignettes that get you going. We, um, over the years, have taken a couple of the corresponding vignettes for RCPP and the linear algebra packages that I didn't talk about, and all these lead uh, vignettes uh, are now peer-reviewed publications. The RCPP piece came out in JSS in 2011, Eigen, I think, last year, Amadio, Conrad, and I put into CSDA. Um, there's a really uh, no-nonsense mailing list that we, that we set up where you can send questions, uh, by now 900 posts in stock overflow, a couple of things floating around on blog posts. Um, another great contribution of JJ's was to convince me to work with him at, uh, with the GitHub facility and have a Jekyll run blog, basically just with write-ups. So we have 90 plus posts in the RCVP gallery. That's also user contributed. So if you do something clever with RCVP, send us a post, we'll have it up there. I have a book out you can buy and read and that's basically what I have. So thank you for attending. You can get me at that email address, and these slides will, in due course, maybe by this afternoon, be at the standard URL where I post slides. And I believe we have time for a question or two. Perfect. Thank you, Jeff.